Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, my name is Dr. Avinash Dadic. I am a professor of law and dean of Institute of Legal Studies and Research, GLA University, Mathura. Today, we are going to talk about very interesting aspect of our society and uh, from that problem, we are all suffering since 75 years or maybe more and that problem is corruption, corruption in public life corruption in private life. And when I say corruption and uh, it is a problem then you need to understand that corruption is not a simple problem which can be understood uh, through the you know some politicians or bureaucrats. Uh, when we understand the social and economic aspects and dimension of corruption then we realize that the people who are looting this country you know through their corrupt activities basically they are taking away the future of uh, Indian generation, Indian people, you know. So, in India corruption is almost everywhere just like other developing countries, but then we have created some special agencies, special laws to prevent and to control and punish those corrupt people. So, today we will talk about introduction of anti-corruption laws and Central Bureau of Investigation CBI because what is CBI, how it works, you know all the things relating to CBI we will do some analysis. So, what is CBI? You know we all you know heard about CBI, CBI is almost everywhere. So, we need to understand what is CBI, how it works, what is their jurisdiction and all the powers with the CBI. CBI is a government agency belonging to government of India that jointly serves as a criminal investigation body. So, first you need to understand at the central level CBI is there okay? and in the state level you will find different agencies within the uh, police like the ACB anti-corruption bureau and in some other states you will find the different names, but in all states you will find a special agency or a special department within the police department. Uh, which is working under the police and the government. Why CBI is important? Because it is a government of Indian agency. So, it is not coming under the preview of the state. So, they are more independent, they are more autonomous that is a point number one. Second, most of the senior people in CBI they are coming on deputation. When I say deputation means that they are working in different organizations like they are working as IP and working in paramilitary forces at the senior positions. They come and work for the CBI for 2 years, 3 years, 5 years, then they go back to their parent organization. So, it means that they do not see a large career, long career with CBI. So, they work more independently, more impartially because they, there is no fear, there is, there is nothing to worry in CBI. Because when you work in a state police then you know that you are going to deal with those people all the time even after you move out of anti-corruption bureau uh, in the police you know because then you know that if you take some action against a corrupt politician or uh, a corrupt civil servant big civil servant then that person can create problems for you once you move to normal positions but with CBI that is not the situation and CBI is the premier investigation investigating police agency in India. That is the number one investigating agency in India. It is an elite force which plays a major role in preservation of values in public life and ensuring the health of a national economy. So, whenever something big happens in India, any, any big corruption, big crime and uh, then people have less faith in their state police, you know they want impartial inquiry, they want impartial investigation then we demand for the CBI inquiry. 
I think that itself demonstrates the value system in CBI that whenever the state police is not capable to do a proper inquiry, then we go for CBI. It is also the nodal police agency in India which coordinates investigation on behalf of the Interpol member countries. Okay. So, Interpol is an organization with uh, headquarter in Paris and uh, in Interpol they work for the international criminals. So, there are a lot of international criminals like the drug mafia and uh, you know money laundering mafia and there are different big international uh, criminal syndicates and gangs. So, Interpol works against those people. So, in India the CBI is the nodal agency if the Interpol uh, needs to coordinate with any Indian agency then they coordinate with CBI. CBI is the foremost investigating police agency in India and also involved in major criminal corruption and investigation cases. Okay. It is not only corruption, it started with corruption cases, but now we are using them in criminal cases also, serious big cases. Agency headquarters situated in New Delhi and they have filled offices in major cities throughout the India. So, in almost like any big state, you will find the uh, regional headquarter of CBI like in UP they have in Lucknow, then Bihar, they in Patna, in every big state you will find the CBI head, regional headquarter. The CBI is overseen by Department of Personal and Training of the Ministry of Personal Public Grievances and Pensions of the Union of, union of Government headed by Union Minister who report directly to the Prime Minister. So, okay, this is like uh, working not with the MHA or any other agency, it works directly under the uh, DPTP. History, how it started? The agency was established in 1941 as the special police establishment. So, pre-independence uh, period during the British period, this agency was established separate from the normal police agency because they needed you know some some agency who can work more efficiently than the police. The function of SPE special police establishment then were to investigate cases of bribery and corruption in transactions with the war and supply department of India during World War II. So, you need to understand that during the World War II there were a lot of financial transaction, logistic transactions were happening in India and lot of corruptions were happening that time. So, to curb that corruption, to control that corruption, the British government started this special unit. Okay. And then uh, SPE was vested with the war department. So, it was clearly specified for a particular purpose to stop corruption in war department. In 1943, an ordinance was issued by the government of India by which a special police force was constituted and vested with powers for the investigation of certain offences committed in connection with the departments of the central government committed anywhere in the British India. So, in 1947 they extended the jurisdiction and functions of CBI, but they constrained the jurisdiction to all central government departments. So, first thing you need to understand that CBI does not do investigation uh, in the state departments. So, if any state department does any corruption, then the matter goes to the state anti-corruption agency or the body as I said anti-corruption bureau, there, there are different names, but they are, they are state police officers. Okay. But if any central government agency or department or central government officer is involved, then only CBI got the exclusive jurisdiction. Okay. Only CBI can do investigation in that matter. And you should not forget that central government is almost everywhere. When I say railway, railway is everywhere, banks are everywhere, you name any big department, you will find that CBI is almost everywhere. Okay. As a need for a central government agency to investigate cases of bribery and corruption was felt even after the end of the war. Okay. The ordinance issued in 1943 which had lapsed on 30th September 1946 
was replaced by Delhi Special Police Establishment Ordinance of 1946. So, CBI is governed by this particular law, Delhi Special Police Establishment Ordinance 1946. And then finally, this ordinance was replaced in act with the same name. Okay. As the CBI over the years established a reputation of being India's premier investigation agency with adequate resources to deal with complicated cases, demands were made on it to take up investigation more cases of conventional crimes such as murder, kidnapping, terrorism also. So, initially CBI started as an agency to take care of the corruption in the central government departments. But with the efficiency and the outcome of the CBI, uh, slowly and slowly CBI got involved in serious offenses. I am not saying very petty offenses, but very serious offenses where the government felt that this particular offense or this particular incident uh, requires a independent high level inquiry and investigation then they invited CBI for even murder, kidnapping, and terrorism and many more cases. The Delhi Special Police Establishment Act transferred the superintendents of SPE to the home department and its function were enlarged to cover all departments of government of India. The DPSC acquired its current name Central Bureau of Investigation but is still governed by the 1946 Act. So, now the name is the new but still this 1946 Act is applicable on CBI. Initially, the offences that were notified by the central government related only to corruption by central government servants. With the nationalization of banks in 1969, the public sector banks and their employees also came with the ambit of the CBI. Because all central government uh, banks, agencies, organization, departments, anything which is central in India comes under the purview of CBI. Since early 1980s, constitutional courts also started referring cases to CBI for inquiry, investigation on the basis of petition filed by the aggrieved person in case of murder, dory death, rapes, etc. So, this was a new development. Uh, initially, the idea was that only central government can uh, evoke the jurisdiction or functioning of CBI. But over the period in last 20 years, what we are observing that even the high court and supreme courts, they have got power, they have got power to give direction to the CBI to do investigation in a particular matter. If any aggrieved person uh, approaches to CBI, uh, approach to high court and supreme court and able to convince the high court and supreme court that this particular case is, is very serious, very complicated and they do not expect justice from the state police because state police uh, might have some conflict of interest situation, conflict of interest or maybe pressure from the uh, politicians or bureaucrats. If they are able to convince this situation to pull a courtroom, then the court can give direction to the CBI that please do investigation in this particular matter and that matter can be murder, dory, death, rape, anything or even corruption also. Okay. So, in this type of matter, CBI does the investigation and finally, CBI submits its inquiry report to the constitutional court. So, that is very interesting development. You can see that uh, even high court and supreme court are using CBI to investigate complex matters. It was therefore decided in 1987 to constitute two investigation division in CBI namely anti-corruption division and special crime division. Okay. So, now in CBI there are two divisions. The latter dealing with case of conventional crime besides economic offenses. Okay. So, now in CBI because they have understood, they have realized that uh, now we are at one uh, level where the government courts they are expecting more from us. So, to deliver in more efficient manner we have to divide our organization within the organization into specialized groups. So, one group deals with only and purely anti-corruption issues and other group deals with special crimes. 
Okay, so special crime can be cyber crime also. Now CBI is doing lot of investigation in cyber crime. Okay, selection committee. How CBI director or how the you know the appoint appointment process happen? You need to understand that CBI is very very powerful organization. People can uh, the system, the government can use or misuse CBI to harass their opponents or do something which is not democratic. So, in this case, the amended Delhi Police Policeman Act gives a very special uh, committee, you know, to dis to appoint the director of CBI. The committee consists of following people. The first is Prime Minister as a chairperson, the leader of opposition as a member, then Chief Justice of India or a Supreme Court judge recommended by the Chief Justice of India as a member. So, it is a very high powered committee and you can easily see that here there is a, a fine balance in democracy when the government and opposition they are working together with the help of the judiciary from the chief justice of this country supreme court they are working together to identify one suitable officer coming from mainly ips very senior officer uh, CBI director is equivalent to DGP in states, very senior IPS officer and uh, uh, then they select one officer to be appointed as a director. And uh, recently the Supreme Court issued some guidelines also that a, a director of CBI cannot be removed before two years of his tenure. Okay. So, there is an interesting development in CBI when making recommendations the committee considers the views of outgoing directors that is very important the outgoing director plays an important role giving the uh, some some input you know about that particular officer and that is again very interesting in CBI that most of the time those officers who are being appointed as a director they have been working with CBI in different locations at different positions like the joint director, special director. So, they have good experience of CBI. It is not like that they appoint someone directly as a director. It happens, I am not saying it does not happen, but normally they prefer to appoint someone as a director who has worked uh, with CBI uh, at a very senior position. And then in that manner ongoing director, outgoing director can give some feedback about that particular officer, about his integrity, about his efficiency, about his leadership style and everything. Above selection committee was constituted under the Lokpal and Lokayukta Act 2013. Before this central vigilance commissioner under CVC Act had this power. The CBI reports to Indian government and not to the individual states. The CBI is headed by director and IPS in the rank of director general of police or commissioner of police. What is the vision of CBI? The motto of CBI is industry, impartiality and integrity. When I say industry means hard work, impartiality means that we are fair, we are, we have nothing to worry, we are absolutely impartial and integrity. Integrity is a very big word, integrity means ethics, moral principles, professional standards. The vision of CBI is to focus on the following, combating, combating corruption in public life, curb econ economic and violent crime through meticulously investigation and prosecution. So, CBI only not only does investigation, but they do prosecution job also. Prosecution means that see uh, normally like in police, the police does only investigation in states. Then there is a separate department of director of prosecution. It is a completely separate from police. So, that department does the prosecution. The prosecution means that they fight for the police in the courtroom to prove the guilty of the accused. Okay. But in CBI, they have appointed their public prosecutors within the department. So, those officers are working within the CBI and they do not do investigation, they just do prosecution. So, it means that CBI is very much active in investigation as well as prosecution. Evolve effective systems and procedures for successful investigation and prosecution of cases in various law courts. Okay. Help fight cyber and high technology crime. This is the new role of CBI in 20, 
uh, after 2010 especially that uh, cyber crime because as you understand that cyber crimes are very complicated in nature and uh, they do not understand the uh, they do not understand and appreciate the territorial jurisdictions of state and country. Okay. So, someone sitting in uh, X state can do crime against Y state uh, person you know without moving at all just through the laptop or computer or a mobile. Okay. In that scenario the CBI being the central investigating agency is working on cyber crime also. Create a healthy work environment that encourages team building, free communication and mutual trust. That is very important in CBI. Support state police organizations and law enforcement agencies in national and international corporations particularly relating to inquiries and investigation of cases. So, CBI does not work like in isolation, they work very closely with state police officers, other law enforcement agencies like IB, RAW. DRI, there are so many law enforcement agencies in India. So, they also collaborate with them and not only at the national level, even they collaborate at the international level uh, regarding any inquiries or investigation of cases. So, CBI is very, very much active in collaboration with everyone uh, in India and abroad. Play a lead role in the war against national and transnational organized crime. Okay. So, this organized crime when I was talking about the big gangs you know the big gangs national or international. So, CBI plays an important role in it how to fight against them. Uphold human rights, protect the environment, arts, antiques and heritage of our civilization. Develop a scientific temper, humanism and spirit of inquiry and reform. Strive for excellence and professionalism in all spheres of functioning that the end so that the organization right to the highest level of endeavor and achievement. Let us talk about now the jurisdiction power, privileges and liabilities. So, when I say jurisdiction means like in law when we say jurisdiction means that within this boundary uh, geographical boundary or the legal boundary you can operate okay? because every agency every uh, everyone in the law. Uh, must have some boundaries. It is not like uh, unlimited power to anyone, okay? whether it is a police, enforcement agency, prosecuting agency or judiciary. They are all working within the boundaries of law. The legal power of investigation of CBI are deprived, uh, derived from DPSC Act 1946. This act confirm concurrent and co-extensive power duties privilege and liabilities on the members of Delhi special police establishment with police officers of union territories. The central government may extend to any area besides union territories the power and jurisdiction member of CBI for investigation subject to the consent of the government of the concerned state. That is very interesting because CBI because we are living in a federal state where the central government as well as the state government both of them have constitutional powers. So, when I say that one federal agency the central government agency like CBI will go and do investigation in a state then as per the law they need consent of the particular state. Added consent is not given case to case basis that consent is normally given as journal that okay, this particular state has given the consent and after that they do not need a consent for all cases. So, what we have observed in last uh, few years that some states they have revoked their consent like for example, recently it happened in West Bengal in Kerala where the government said no we do not want to give our consent to CBI to come to our state and do investigation. Okay. So, in that case the matter is pending before the Supreme Court of India and Supreme Court is deciding whether that type of consent is required or not. But that is a very uh, important issue because in the absence of the consent of the uh, particular state government CBA cannot function in that particular state. Members of the CBI at or above the rank of sub inspector may be considered officer in charge of the police stations. Okay. Under the act 
CBI can investigate only with notification by the central government. Political interference in the cases assigned to CBI are sensitive and national importance. It is a usual practice for the respective state police department to initially register any case coming under its jurisdiction and if necessary through mediation by the central government the case may be transferred to the CBI. So, you need to understand CBI does not file FIR by its own, CBI asks the local police of local, local police station to file FIR. But uh, if, if they are facing an issue then there is a mediation or there is a discussion between central and state then they file the FIR. Section 2 of the act vested deep SPE with jurisdiction to investigate offenses in the union territories only. So, initially the idea was that the CBI will do investigation only in the central union territories you know because state territories are beyond the power of the central. However, the jurisdiction can be extended by the central government to other areas including railway areas states under section 51 of the act provided the state government accords consent under section 6 of the act. The executive powers of CBI of the rank of sub inspector and above exercise all powers of a station office in charge of the police station for the concerned area for the purpose of investigation. So, sub inspector can be considered as a SHO in terms of CRPC. Okay. So, he got the full power of CRPC uh, as the rank of sub inspector and above. As per section 3 of the act, special police establishment is authorized to investigate only those cases which are notified by the central government from time to time. High court and supreme courts, what is the role of high court and supreme court in CBI? So, now let us talk about the high court and supreme court uh, and CBI. According to five judge constitutional bench of Supreme Court held the state of West Bengal versus others a committee for protection of democratic rights West Bengal and others 2010. The high court and Supreme Court have the jurisdiction to order a CBI inquiry into an offense alleged to have been committed in a state without the state's consent. So, that is very interesting judgment. If high court and Supreme Court believes that a crime has been committed in a state and if that particular state is not giving its consent, still high court and supreme court give can give direction to the CBI for conducting a proper investigation. That is not possible for a state government because without the consent of the uh, states they cannot in initiate an inquiry, but high court and supreme court being the constitutional protector of the country because if any crime happens in any part of this country, they have full right and full constitutional duty to protect the citizens democratic rights. So, in this case in 2010, it was well established that they have power uh, over the state's consent. Bench ruled that being the protector of civil liability and civil liberties of the citizens, this court and high courts have not only the power of jurisdiction, power and jurisdiction, but also an obligation to protect the fundamental rights guaranteed by part 3 in journal and under article 21 of the constitution in particularly zealously. Okay. So, this is not only the power because as you need, you need to understand that in Indian constitution gives us some fundamental rights. Okay and those fundamental rights are protected by the government or if the government fails to protect those fundamental rights, then any person can approach to any high court under article 2 to 6 and article 3 to of to directly to the supreme court. So, these high courts and supreme courts they are the main guardian and protector of Indian constitution and the fundamental rights of the citizens. The court also clarified that it is an extraordinary power which must be exercised very carefully in very exceptional situation. So, most of the time high courts and supreme court they do not exercise this power, they ask concerned people to approach their local police. They say okay, first you go to the local police, try to you know file a case and if still you are not satisfied 
and you believe that the local police due to some political pressure or some other types of pressure or maybe inefficiency or maybe the involvement of multi-state crimes then only you come to us and then we will pass an order. How CBI functions? So, now you understand uh, the CBI jurisdictions, but let us understand how CBI functions. The following are the functions of CBI. Investigation of cases related to corruption, schemes and misbehavior of central government officers. So, these are the important thing. Investigation of serious crimes having national or international ramifications and maintaining crime statistics and disseminate, disseminate criminal information. The conviction rate of CBI that is very important whether CBI is an in, uh, effective uh, agency or not that can be seen through the conviction rate of CBI. Although the conviction uh, overall conviction rate in cases registered by the CBI was 69, 65 and 68 uh, percentages respectively studies have pointed out that success ratio in the corruption case stands around a dismissal of 3 percent. Okay. So, you need to understand that CBI may be very effective in filing cases. So, you need to understand at, at two points here filing a case or conviction. Conviction means that person is going to jail. Okay. There are two different things. So, maybe CBI can file many corruption cases, but so far it shows that the conviction rate in corruption cases is not more than 3 percent. In a written reply to the Lok Sabha in December 2017, Jitendra Singh, the minister, admitted that in last uh, past four years, 3,260 people booked by the CBI in various corruption cases had been acquitted. So, these 3,260 people, instead of going to jail, finally they were acquitted by the court. And when I say by the court, means that the courts are taking decision on the basis of evidence available to them, given to them by the CBI. Okay. Of these 904 people were acquitted in 2016, 821 2015 and so it is very clear that a majority of the people booked by the CBI are not going to jail and that is a very serious concern for CBI. Now, uh, let us examine the another aspect of CBI right to information. CBI is exempted from the provision of the Right of Information Act 2005 being the uh, premier investigating body of the government of India, CBI is exempted. The exemption was granted by government on 9th June 2011 with similar exemptions to the National Investigating Agency NIA. NIA does investigation especially in cases of terrorism and Director General of Income Tax Investigation and National Intelligence Grid. Okay, net grid on the basis of national security. Okay. It was criticized by the Central Information Commission and RBI activists who said the blanket exemption violated the letter and intent of the RDA Act. So, this is a classical case, but most of the time all intelligence agencies, investigating agencies are exempted uh, from the uh, preview of RTI. But uh, one thing can be seen that I am not sure that how CBI uh, is doing anything confidential because all those matters, all those documents are public documents because they go to the court. So, if anything is going to court room, that document becomes more or less public document, public record. So, I do not think that much of the documents can be protected under the RTI. However, their internal discussions, internal memos, documents, all these documents are protected by RTI. So, now let us see some case laws. So, the first is as Vijaya, uh, Vijaya uh, Sumi versus Union of India, the Supreme Court observed that during the hearing, the appellant submitted that, uh, that the sought for information should be provided to him as it involves large public interest and are related to corruption and corrupt practices indulged in by said organization. In such situation, the exemption provided under section 24 of RTI cannot be fully claimed. The CBI is just like a police organization of central government undertaking investigation relating to corruption cases and financial fraud. The main duty is investigation only. He also submitted that as per the Supreme Court judgment is 
the CBI is duty bound to upload all of its FIR on its website like other police establishment. So, CBI is just like other police stations authorized to register FIR, file charge sheet and conduct prosecution appeals in criminal cases. Actually, it is not entitled to blanket exemption from the applicability of the RTA Act under section 24 because its main function is to conduct investigation into cases of such nature. So, that was the submission of the uh, party. CBI political overtone has been exposed by formal officials such as Joginder Singh and B. R. Lal, director and joint director respectively as engaging in nepotism, wrongful prosecution and corruption. According to B. R. Lal, who owns CBI, he wrote a book detailed how investigations are manipulated and derailed in CBI. Corruption within the organization has been revealed in information obtained under the RTA Act and RTA Act activist Krishnanand Tripathi has alleged harassment from the CBI to save itself from exposure via RTI. So, you, you can understand that CBI is also not beyond uh, the preview of the public scrutiny and lot of people they are challenging, they are asking questions to CBI. See this is very uh, simple beauty of democracy that no one is above the law, you know. Maybe someone is doing investigation in corruption cases, but at the end of the day everyone including CBI is within the preview of the law and if they do something wrong they also have to suffer. So, recently maybe you have read that few months back few officers of CBI they were arrested by the CBI in the for the charge of corruption. So, even the CBI is also very uh, careful nowadays that some of their officers might be involved in corruption activity. So, this is very interesting that CBI is arresting CBI officers. But this is a good sign of democracy where uh, people like B. R. Lal and uh, Mr. Joginder Singh and RTA activists like Krishna and Tripathi, they were they are all raising uh, relevant questions uh, and those questions might lead to more transparency and accountability for the people. Normally, cases assigned to CBI are sensitive and national importance. It is standard practice for state police departments to register cases under its own jurisdiction. If necessary, the central government may transfer a case to the CBI. The agency has been criticized for its mishandling of several schemes. It also been criticized about dragging its feet investigating prominent politicians like PM Marsinga Rao, Jay Lalita, Lalu Prasad Yadav, Mayawati and Mulayam Singh Yadav. These tactics lead to their acquittal or non-prosecution. So, this is very uh, interesting case that all of the big guys, uh, they were investigated by the CBI. Uh, there are two elements here that um, some people say that the government or the, uh, the power people in the power, they misuse sometime CBI processors and system. At the same time, some people argues that CBI did not act very carefully while they are doing investigation against very powerful people. Present scenario, after being caught in so many controversies, CBI is appearing to be more like a train wreck in slow motion. So, now CBI is introspecting you know what is going on. Recently, maybe you have seen cases where uh, there was a very serious is, uh, situation in CBI headquarters where they were uh, two directors were uh, acting all together, one director was replaced by government, the another director was uh, appointed by the government and then uh, through the intervention of the Supreme Court, the matter was finally resolved that who is the real director of CBI. So, this is a very serious situation when, uh, when we expect from an agency like CBI to act in the most transparent and most professional manner and then we see there is a leadership crisis, leadership understanding even at the top level, so that can create a serious issue. Looking at these type of terrible condition, it can be, it can be said that there is a need to change the mechanism of our institutions like CBI. Uh, I am little bit critical right now because see uh, you have seen the CBI, what they do, how they do, what is their power. By CBI is just like a police, you know, they have got some special powers at the central level, uh, but finally, 
when they go to the court room uh, to you know charge someone again in the case of corruption or special crime then as per the crpc or evidence uh, there is no difference basically you know crpc and evidence law uh, apply in the same manner for cbi as well as for the state police so we cannot say that um, last 20 30 years the cbi is bringing more outcome in terms of conviction uh, this data is very clear that cbi has to improve that you know 3% conviction rate in cases of corruption is not very uh, motivating and uh, encouraging for any democracy the main problem of CBI can also identify as it is not a legal entity and it is used by the government to fulfill its needs. Supreme Court case Parrot remark. That is very important that legal entity, when I say legal entity means that CBI is not protected by the constitution. When I say the important organizations like CAG, uh, Computer Auditor Journal or Election Commission or you know, High Court or the Supreme Court even the senior uh, civil servants, so many organizations, so many institutions are protected under the constitution. Okay? That type of protection is not available to CBI and sometime in the absence of uh, non-compliance of Supreme Court directions, CBI director and senior officers are at the mercy of the current government. If they want to continue with CBI, they have to follow the uh, unofficial directions of all governments. I am not saying this present government or the past government. Uh, this has been a practice in our country where people misuse CBI for their own personal uses. Uh, but obviously, that is a separate part, the political part. But if I talk only about the legal aspect, that if CBI gets the constitutional protection, okay then it will be easy for CBI directors just like election commissioner, the, if you remember the TN session or if you uh, remember the Mr. Roy in the CAG who exposed 2G spam, call spam. So, the idea is that if we can give more protection to CBI through the constitution, then they can bring better outcome. Or recently the Supreme Court has issued uh, very uh, powerful guidelines regarding appointment and removal of CBI director. Okay. So, if that type of thing can also be implemented by governments in a fair manner, that can also help the CBI to work in a professional manner. CBI needs to be function impartially and effective. This is very clear because people have a lot of faith on CBI. If CBI fails, then I really do not see any central agency who can do proper investigation in special crimes and anti-corruption issues. So, we cannot allow CBI to fail you know and to protect our democracy, to protect our institutions, we have to create a mechanism where CBI functions impartially and effectively. Certain measures uh, as I said that we need, we must take care of. One of the measures can be legally defining the status and power of CBI and not allowing any affluent person to enjoy the exemption. This is very important because if you see still CBI is using the law enacted by the British people in 1946. You know, the objective of Britishers were not to expose corruption. I think they, they, they had different objectives. You know, the, the one of the objective was obviously to curb the corruption in the war department and then after the war department other central departments. But now if you see the federal structure because that time there was no federalism there was only central government's power. So, it was a much easy for uh, that agency to work at the central level. But now considering the dynamic uh, nature of Indian democracy emerging of new institutions like high court, supreme court and other agencies, important laws like RTI, uh, openness through the social media, print media, digital media. So, now CBI cannot act as a you know very specialized agency by the central government. There has to be democratic setup in the functioning of CBI. So, when I said democratic setup, maybe the role of state governments in the CBI procedure. I am not saying that 
this will not disturb the impartial nature of CBI. But when I say that in a federal state, it is very difficult to work without the support of the central uh, state governments. Okay. In this case, the state governments can play an important role and there is no doubt there is a need of CBI to undergo, undergo a serious reforms. Conclusions, the Central Bureau of Investigation basically deals with cases relating to national security and does not in interfere in small issues. So, that is very important that CBI should not interfere, should not jump into small petty issues which we have seen in last uh, 10, 20, 30 years that uh, CBI is doing investigation even some cases where uh, it more like in a politically motivated cases or maybe some other uh, factors, but those cases should not be dealt by the CBI, you know, the PT offenses, the small political, small, uh, pro, you know, the scandals. Because when I say the elite force of CBI, then we need to understand that it is a limited force, you know, they do not have enough resources. So, if you ask them to do investigation in each and every case, not in each and every case, but so many cases, then it affects the quality of investigation. Okay. And when the investigation is not strong enough, then finally, the acquittal rate increases, you know, the conviction rate decreases and that is not good for any investigation organization. The second argument uh, which can be very important in the conclusion that can we design a internal cadre of CBI, you know, that instead of too much deputation from different departments like the police or BSF, CRPF, so many department people are coming and working with CBI and it is very difficult for those officers to, uh, you know, integrate. Uh, in the CBI culture very quickly and they come only for 2 to 3 years. So, sometimes it is very difficult for those officers to understand the CBI culture. So, that can be another suggestion that if we can create a strong cadre of CBI, they have a strong cadre at the constable and sub inspector level, but when they when they move DSP, SP, DIG, IG, then uh, people are coming from different organizations. That is one of the problem. Uh, the another problem people do argue that lot of senior IPS officers are coming at the uh, you know positions of DIG and IG. And uh, when you see the nature of the investigation, nature of work at the state police and CBI, it is very, very different. So, sometime even it is argued that when you bring a police officer from a state, uh, who has got maybe 10, 15 years experience in local policing, okay, but not dealing with serious issues of corruption or special crimes, maybe that officer is not that empowered and trained to deal with those complex issues. Okay. So, that can be the one argument. So, can we create a system within the CBI that someone joins as a DSP and that guy goes to the DIG, IG and director level. So, uh, that can be a good example uh, of creating a talent pool within the organization instead of relying on other organizations to supply human resources for a, a limited period, you know, because time is very important here. And though being an elite force of the nation still is needs to undergo structure reforms to work effectively. This structure reforms are very important. It is not an issue of law, but it is all about how CBI is structured, you know, how they are working from human resources to financial resources, technological resources, uh, interfere from the political and uh, the bureaucrats, the civil servants by the ministry how uh, we can create a structure where the structure works independently, you know, the structure keeps a, a like, you know, we call it arm's length distance from the government. Okay. We cannot allow CBI to work only for the government, because that is not the objective of CBI. All these organizations are government organizations like the RBI. RBI 
uh, is not working for the government officially and technically. RBI is supposed to work for the economy, for the country. In the same manner, CBI is not supposed to work for the political powers or the senior bureaucrats. CBI is supposed to work for the economy, for the anti-corruption issues, for serious offenses, coordinating with international organizations like the Interpol, coordinating with the state uh, organizations. And once we, once we free CBI from political interference, then I believe the dispute between central and state political parties will not affect CBI in their functioning. So that is very important, you know, right now and the states, especially in last five to seven years, states are seeing CBI as a, uh, you know, weapon from the central government. But that is not the good sign for any democracy. CBI still is a very independent and impartial organization. But if we can create some legal structure for CBI, then CBI can work more effectively. The most important reason behind is the way of uh, tackling political sensitive issues with ending up to the part of controversies. CBI should not involve in any political controversy because ultimately once they are involved in any political controversy, their core job, their core job is anti-corruption, their core job is serious offenses, multinational offenses, offenses which are affecting the country at large. So these uh, small PT political controversies are really affecting the uh, brand value of CBI. After being called a caged parrot by the Supreme Court, it continues to disappoint people when dealing with any case against the superior. In order to obtain public confidence back and restore the integrity of CBI, it needs to have financial autonomy. That is very important and importantly, it must have a statutory status through legislature as provided to uh, Computer and Auditor General and Election Commission of India. So the same argue, see we have to give financial autonomy. If we really want that one organization should work independently, we need to give them financial autonomy. Okay? So this autonomy can help the CBI just like Election Commission of India and uh, CAG. Okay? So you will find many organizations in this country where they are working under the government, but they are independent from the government. Financially, they are autonomous, administratively, they are autonomous and they can take right decision for this country rather than their uh, superiors and their bosses. So my dear students, now I will finish this uh, presentation on CBI. I believe that now after this lecture, you will understand that what is CBI, what CBI does what are the powers of CBI, how CBI powers are restricted uh, from state to central, what type of officers and departments comes you know, under the CBI investigation and finally the CBI uh, prosecution power, police power and the uh, lacunas or limitations or shortcoming in CBI investigation, CBI autonomy, CBI functioning and how to solve, how to make CBI the most efficient organization in our country so that our country can grow without corruption and to protect the life, property and reputation of normal citizens. Thank you very much.